Um, so I'm going to talk a bit to you about Shakespeare and anti-Semitism and just talk a little bit about the background of um, what anti-Semitism is and then we'll go through a little bit about the pre-Shakespeare time history and talk a little bit about what was happening in um, Elizabethan times to and why Shakespeare wrote the play in the way he did. Um, and touch on just not the characterization because that's your English teacher's job and that's one of my favorite things to teach as an English teacher, so I'll leave that for them. But um, look at how Shylock was portrayed from you know in Victorian times and in the 20th century, and then I'll finish with thinking you know, about how he's portrayed today. Um, as an English teacher, it was really this was something that I loved I, because I love history. I love finding out why things were um, in a, in a, in a pointing out about society because what I really passionately believe and what I love about English is that English is the window is a window to society. You know? The movies, the films, the plays, the poetry, the writing, it just tells us what a society is like. And I think it's really fascinating. Um, there's nothing more important than using popular culture to judge what is happening in a society. And I think English does that wonderfully. Um, so that I, love, I love how English and history meet. Uh, so, anti-Semitism. So, what is it? At its most basic, it's that you don't like Jewish people. Okay. So, the religion of Jews is Judaism, J-U-D-A-I-S-M, so Judaism is the religion. And anti-Semitism anti sorry, is um, said to be the longest form of hatred. Um, it's, you, you look, at, look we know a lot about prejudice and stereotypes, and English is, you know, something we examine those and help you understand people and since the since the birth of modern western civilization there's always been this real tension with Jewish people. Why? Religion, you know. So Judaism is a religion and anti-Semitism is a, you know, a dislike or fear of Jewish people. So we can track it all the way back to Jesus. Jesus is the reason there is anti-Semitism. You know? If we think about religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, they all have their roots in the Old Testament. Who's heard of a guy called Abraham? Okay. This, you know, Abraham is supposed to be old father Abraham, and Islam and Judaism and Christianity, they're what's called Abrahamic religions. And they all have their roots, they all have the same forefathers. So, you know, what's the problem? They all began in the same way. So, when was the split? And it was Jesus. So, you've got a group of people, and Jesus was a Jew. Okay? There was, there was, and when he came in, he said, I am the Son of God, I you know, the prophet. Some of the people didn't believe that, and some of the people did. Now, after Jesus' death in AD 32, all the way back then, that's when Christianity was, was born. And that's when there was a big split. So you've got a group of Jews who believe Jesus was the Son of God, and you've got a group of Jews who don't. Now one group holds fast to what they, the, what they believe in and their old beliefs. And if you know the Bible, you know it's split into two major parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So those Jews who didn't believe in Jesus, they held fast to their belief in what they thought were the teachings of God and the Old Testament. And these new people, they wrote about Jesus, okay, and that became the New Testament. 
and eventually they became known as Christians. Okay? So there was a big split in religions. And if you know anything about religion, when there's a split, there's a tension. So we can see that although they believe in some similar stuff, those little differences make a big difference. So if you know anything, if you know anything about Islam, there's the Shia and the Shiites. So, and there's, if you watch the news the other night, you see that there are lots of people killed in the car bomb in Baghdad, and you know, that's Shia and Shiites fighting. So religious conflict is, is nothing new. But for us, and for anti-Semitism, the split begins with Christians and Jews. So, when you're starting something new, if you were starting a new gang, if um, Happy was going to start his new library gang, I'm going to pick on people I know, sorry. What's he going to do? He's going to go to the library and say, I'm starting a new gang, I'm different to you. I'm different to the old gang, I'm new, I'm better. So, he would say, you know, I want everyone to have bad new cats like me, because that's how I'm going to make myself different and separate. So, that's... The important things become the differences and, and the separations. And eventually people, you know, happy would get angry with the other group because he wants to be better. And so, you know, and the, and the tension because of the difference increases. Um, so, because Christianity developed and spread throughout Western Europe, which is, and then all through Europe, they wanted to separate themselves from the old religion. So the old religion was Judaism, and the Christians thought, no, we are the new religion, we are the right religion. So one of the ways in which you do that is you emphasize the differences. So in medieval times, kings, queens, all that sort of jazz, um, there was a great church building period. Okay, so cathedrals, massive churches, they were built. And a lot of what Christians believed were built into the building. This is a picture, and it's called Judensal, which is a German phrase. Juden, which means Jude, and Sal, which means peak. So the picture here, um, this is from a cathedral in Germany. You see there's a peak, and you'll see that there's a bunch of Jews having a good old feed underneath, suckling from the pig, and there's a couple of Jews doing naughty things to the pig at the back. Why would you put this on a church? Okay, it's it's a, it's carved into the church. It's been there for hundreds of years because you want to make Jews look like a bag of weirdos. Okay, it's about creating that difference. Um, does anyone know why putting a pig there would be the worst possible thing for a Jew? Yeah? Yeah. So, religions have rules, and one of the rules for Judaism is that you don't eat pork and shellfish, you don't mix milk and meat. So, if you say you can't eat pork, and then you make a statue of a whole bunch of people suckling from a pig and doing bad things to a pig, you know, you're, you're making a pretty big statement there. You're saying, you know, look at these weird Jews. They're crazy. So, this is an example of anti-Semitism. You know, saying, this is a group, it's different, and we don't like you. So, in medieval times, because the church was very powerful, the church and religion became the main way of, or, very important way of expressing who you are. And because Europe is very Christian, um, the creation of the idea that, that Jews were bad, that, that difference was bad, was really important to build your own sense of identity. Part of being a New Zealander is saying, oh, Australia. Oh, I've got family in Australia, so it pains me to admit it. But, you know, saying, oh, you're a Kiwi, don't like those Aussies. Okay? It's just like saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I don't like those Jews. But where, where does a bit of fun become like hard and prejudiced and, and quite violent? Is, okay, that kind of tips it over. 
So in medieval times, there were lots of stories about how Jews were going to come and get you. You know, they're the monster under the bed. And one of the most powerful expressions of this is something called blood libel. In England, um, a small child went missing from a village. And to explain the disappearance, one of the villagers said that a Jewish person stole the child, used, killed them, and used their blood in ceremonies, and they drank it. Okay? So, this became part of Christian culture. There was a fear that Jews were using children in their ceremonies, and they were using them as sacrifices. This is called blood libel. So you've got a picture up there of, you know, oh, it's Jewish dinner time. We're going to uh, get this poor, innocent Christian child there. We're going to cut them open, and we're going to use their blood in our religious ceremonies. So it was a pretty powerful idea of first of difference, and then that difference kind of hardens into fear. And when you fear something, that normally turns into some kind of hate. Okay, so this is the development of anti-Semitism in, in medieval times. Um, with blood libel, uh, it, it was very powerful and there was a real fear that Christian children were going missing. So, if you think of some of the worst things you can do in a society, it's to harm children because children are innocent and children need your, your defense and your help. So to, to um, make Jews seem like child snatching nasties was very important for people in building that kind of idea of them and us. So if you've got a group of people who are scary, they do things different to you, um, they are they, religion of strange, they like to kill children. So you, you're starting to build a real powerful sense of difference. Another way in which Christian society um, built a very powerful difference is through something called usury. Now, is anyone a Christian? Is anyone's parents involved in the banking industry a Christian? It would have been bad in medieval times. So, Christy, well, medieval Christianity said that you shouldn't lend money and you shouldn't charge interest. That was a very unchristian thing to do. Okay? So, that was known as ursary. That was, was known as being very greedy. Jewish people in Judaism had no strictures on that. There was nothing that said that, no, you can't, you can't lend money and you can't actually charge interest. So, in throughout Europe, Jewish people um, became the money lenders. Okay? Not just the sole group who were money lenders, but because Christians looked down on money lending as a job, often they um, it was left to the Jewish community to pick it up. You know, you fill a gap. So um, Jewish people became money lenders. And that feeds really powerfully into what um, Shakespeare is going to be drawing on. So, Jewish people can be money lenders, and anyone, anyone who's doing business or economics knows, uh, finance, finance is very, you know, very important, um, and you can earn a lot of money charging, you know, working in finance, charging interest. So there was also that kind of building of wealth. Now if someone hates you, you're not going to try and do your best to go up to them and say, you know, let's get to know each other. Often it's easier just to stay in your group. So because Miss Phillips and Mr. Kirk hate me up in the staff room, I just don't to them and I just stay in my own little group. You know, that's comfortable and, you know, and just, I share my lunch with someone else, that's fine. But the same thing happened with Jews in Europe. So if you've got people who are separated by religion, and often by occupation, um, they form really tight communities. So there was a building of the sense of community.
community within Judaism, and Christians were aware of this as well. Ghettos, not just in southeast LA or Detroit. Okay, we all know what a ghetto is. And you go, oh yeah, you know, if, if you um, if you want to try and uh, give yourself some some swag, you might say, you know, I live in South Auckland, you know, and close to the ghetto. But ghetto, the word itself actually derives from um, so from Venice, and it was specifically a Jewish place, and so it's formed from an Italian word because this is where Jews lived, and this is the only place where Jews could live. So you've got Il Ghetto there. Sounds better in Italian, doesn't it? I think it does. But you've got a really really strong sense of community from without, from, from external forces. So people saying, we don't like you, we're going to use you for this, we're going to force you to live here. And within the Jewish community you've got, oh my goodness, we've got to stick together or, you know, this is this power within the group. And Jewish ghettos formed in quite a few cities throughout Europe. Um, in England, they expelled, they told all Jews he had to leave the country until Oliver Cromwell said, uh, you can come back. So Oliver Cromwell was, um, I forget the exact dates, but he, he was the, the ruler of England at the time and he invited the Jews back. But they moved into their own ghettos. Now if you, you know, been in Europe, In all the old cities of Europe, you have quarters, you know, places in the city where people, where groups of people lived. You nearly always find a Jewish quarter. Um, in modern times, you have things like Chinatowns, um, say like in London, you have Brick Lane now. You'll have areas where, where people of a similar cultural religion will gather. So if we think of, just before you get into Shakespeare's time, you'll have an area where there are a concentration of people who are the same, a concentration of Jewish people. Today in London, as Mr. Kirk will probably know, there are concentrations of Jewish people, particularly in North London um, and around the Barnet area. There are like, my friend lived in Barnet and when I used to go visit him and walk around and you know, go out and stuff, lots of lots of Jewish people. Um, and you can tell who they who they are because of how they dressed. And that's, oops, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Oh, no, I did that. That's another important thing that people can mark who you are by how you dress. So you've got a community of people who are defined by their religion, often by their occupation, often by the fact that they've been pushed out and they've come back. And you've got a community of people who look different. Who knows anything about any about the Jewish form of dress? So often we wear a keeper, which is a skull cap. Um, often uh, there were shawls, there were beards, there were ringlets around the foreheads. Um, so they had their own ways of dressing religiously, and. We'll get to it, but in England, they were forced to wear certain clothes to show that they were Jews, just in case people could confuse you with being a Christian, because they couldn't mix you up. But we'll get into that in a second. Elizabethan times in England. Rodrigo Lopez is not um, a basketballer, although when I, was, when I typed in Rodrigo Lopez on the Google, um, a, a baseballer came up, I thought that it was him. It's a much cooler picture, but I don't know if I can convince you that he was a Elizabethan. Rodrigo Lopez was a, a, a famous villain in Shakespearean London. He was singled out as a spy, and he had converted 
from Judaism to Christianity. Okay? He was hung, he was killed in, in, as a spy. And people jumped on the fact that, ah, this is the reason why he is such a bad egg, because he was Jewish. And people hated him. People cheered when he was hung. The hangings were quite a party back then. Saturday night, didn't go to the movies. Uh, go see a nice hanging. That big blockbuster hanging. One billion dollar avatar like thing, I don't know. But there was there was a lot of that had stirred up a lot of anger to other Jews because you've got this person who spied on England. Um, and one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, called Christopher Marlowe. Um, this guy is pretty cool. You go look at him and you think, oh, anyone who wears 1600 buttons can't be that cool or that tough. Uh, he was a knife fighter, he was a brawler. Died in a knife fight. It's pretty, pretty cool for a playwright, see? Yeah, playwrights can be cool too. But Marlowe, who was around the same time as Shakespeare, he wrote a play called The Jew of Malta. Um, now Malta is a small island, just, uh, just, just off, is it off Greece, I don't know, Mediterranean, yeah, something there. But uh, in this play, the main character was a Jew, and he poisoned people, he killed babies, um, he was a really nasty villain, and this was a runaway success. People loved it. People loved this play. It was, it was a massive play. And people loved to laugh at the evil Jewish villain. You know, if you've got um, a spy in real life who is Jewish, you go, know, well, yeah, I've got to trust those Jews. And then you've got a play where someone kind of plays on, you know, he uses that, you know, what you're feeling, and you, know, you can tap into how people feel. For example, like, um, I just showed my year 11's the World Trade Center video with Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. And, you know, it's kind of sad, but it feeds into that, that emotion that people have about the 9-11 attacks. And you go, okay, that's a big event. People know about that. People can feel like they're angry. And, and that movie feeds into that, and you know, mm, damn you terrorists, killing this innocent policeman and fireman. And the same thing happened with this Jew of Malta. So people really liked it, but it kind of shows you the feeling towards Jewish people at the time. So, to the Merchant of Venice, if you can read it, so you've got the most excellent history of the Merchant of Venice with the extreme cruelty of Shylock the Jew to work towards the said merchant in cutting a soft pound of his flesh and the obtaining of Portia by the choice of three chests. chests. There you go. Okay. We've kind of developed how we use titles these days. And usually we don't like titles that are paragraph long, but you know. That's alright. So you've got explicitly Shylock the Jew. And Shakespeare would not only put that in the you own, know, oh, people will know about Jews. We'll, we'll use it as a device and draw on what people know. And Everyone does it. You have stock characters that you use. You have, like, um, in Shoreland Street, you know, you've got the uh, Pacifica nurse with, with, the, with the tattoos. And, you know, I'm surprised you have got a Maori nurse that plays the guitar and, and you know, does a boy and a bit fun. So Shakespeare will use his, use what people know. So you've got Shylock, who is a Jew, and of course, you know, he has to be a money lender because everyone knows that Jews are money lenders. Um, and also, if I need a villain character, I'm going to use Shylock because he's a Jew and everyone knows that Jews are villains. My mate Christopher Marlowe, who's written to Stuart's villain, I'm going to kind of work and trade on what people know and understand. So, when Shylock was performed, and I'm not going to go into this a lot, but just touch on. Um, he either wore a big, great big red wig or a big red hat 
He wore a cape, okay? Because everyone knows that people in capes are evil. Look at that, made a cape. It has to be a big cape. Can't be a Superman in cape, because that's all right. It's a big cape. So you've got Shylock, who is identified as a Jew by wearing red hat wigs. That's what Jews are forced to wear, the same kind of costumes to identify themselves. You know, this is, no, this is nothing new, nothing new. People from different groups wore different clothes to show who they were, but um, often you didn't have any choice. So if you're poor, you couldn't wear this type of clothes. Which you had. So it was form of, of identification. So the audience would know straight away that, okay, the bloke with the red, red hat, the red wig, and the big cape, you know, skulking around the stage is going to, is going to be the Jew. Um, so, what Shakespeare is doing is he is drawing on prejudice of what people know. You know he's drawing on the fact that people don't like Jews very much. And remember that Shakespeare was a master of, of performing to the lowest common denominator of society as well as the you know, kings and queens. He is, you know, this is a character that people had to know and understand. And they had to like this character. You either like to love them or you like to hate them. So, you know, in the Globe Theatre you have all of the poor drunk people, you know, going there for a beer and maybe a war and a good night out. In the theatre, theatres have changed now a little bit. Probably be looked down upon. But they had to recognise and yell and shout and cheer at the characters. So, if you think those people had to know just as much about Jewish people or have just the same prejudices as people who were learned. Um, so, Shakespeare drew on all of that sort of stuff. And um, you've got different ways that Shylock has been portrayed. And what's interesting is the way Shylock has been portrayed has shifted with the way society understands Jewish people. Okay? So the, the power of the playwright only goes so far and then the play becomes, it belongs to the time. So you've got this pretty funny um, film poster there. Charlotte said, hey y'all. Um, still probably not a character you can say, oh, it's a fine upstanding man, I do feel sorry for him. You know? um, but these kind of things affect your reading. So how you view a play. The most famous uh, modern use of Merchant of Venice was in Nazi Germany, where Merchant of Venice was the most popular of Shakespeare's plays to be read, to be played. Okay, so we've got a really kind of neat tracking of anti-Semitism. You may or may not know that Hitler doesn't like Jews, um, but he takes his not liking of Jews to whole new levels. Whole new levels. He, he kind of, the same thing happens, he puts Jews in ghettos, the same thing happens. He makes Jews wear clothes to identify themselves. Okay? Um, might like send the, the Star of David, which is the Jewish, which is the Jewish religious symbol. And in Nazi Germany, you can imagine how Shylock was played. Shylock was you know, creeping around, back to being the baby eating evil Jew, and everyone's like, yay, he's dying. So it it was it was heavily edited. So some of the speeches that you'll study where you go, yeah, you know, you feel sorry for him, you know. Do I not bleed? All that sort of stuff. It was edited out. So, that was really important, I guess. And if you want to see um, just how anti Semitism works in Shakespeare, it really does depend on the society who is reading it or performing it. You know, who is performing it? It's really important. There is a lot of debate. Like I was reading through some of the discussions about whether Merchant of Venice really is anti-Semitic and against Jewish people. T 
Today, the consensus is, uh, yeah, yeah, it is, you know. Yeah, Shakespeare does show on some hands on that I mean, he was aware that Jewish people might have been a little oppressed, you know. There, there was, he writes, which is incredible for people those days, in a way where you can feel sorry for a Jewish character. But, you know, you've got the fact that he is a money villain. Um, it's still quite controversial. Um, whenever this is put into film, whenever this is played, it, it still raises similar, the same debates about whether this is against Jewish people or not. Um, just fairly recently, there was a, um, a just a girls' school in England, and they were performing it, and there was a walkout and a boycott of all of the Jewish girls um, from the play because they believed that it was anti-Semitic, and they went to the papers and they complained. Um, more recent film adaptions, you know, we don't see, you know, the, the typical stereotypical evil villain Jew, um, and even even in the Maori version, is that the Maori version, which one is? Into the Maori, pretty cool. Well, it's hard. I can translate Shakespeare in English to Te Reo Māori and I just don't know. Oof. So, you know, there, there is a kind of move away. But the thing with history is that um, some things stay the same and some things are different. So the way in which we read this play, the way that you're reading it, is probably different to the way that Shakespeare thought the audience should read it. We can we understand that we can we have the advantage of, of hindsight that we read it from a critical point of view. So some things are different, but some things stay the same. Um, just popped onto Urban Dictionary briefly because it's pretty nasty. It's 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 troll magnet slash heaven is uh, Urban Dictionary, um, and you know. Charlotte was a character in one of Shakespeare's plays. Can't spell Shakespeare. Star Shakespeare. Um, he was a Jewish usurer, so saying that a person is a Charlotte means he's a loan shark. So you really shouldn't mess with the guys down in 57. They're real Charlottes, and the interest rates will kill you. Ooh. And another term for a mafia loan money collector. There you go. Anyone seen the character Chili Palmer? Get Shorty B. Cool, John Travolta? Probably one of his better roles. Apart from dressing up as a woman in the musical, it's hilarious. <laughs> I think I might go back to my old job being a Shylock. So, you know, um, one of one of my friend's brothers used his friend called him a, a Jew boy because he wouldn't put in for this uh, game they were buying on the PlayStation. So. As much as things change, some things remain the same in, in history. And I think it's part of the study of history, which, you know, and use of literature, is that you can track that. Um, some things definitely remain the same. And South Park is, you know, the guy's Jewish, so uh, they make fun of themselves. Parody themselves, but you know, same stuff still applies. You've still got a Jewish person who is dressed differently, who identifies. You can easily identify who is a money lender. You know, so many evil times to South Park. What is the same and what has changed? There you go. I've sent the link, links just to a brief notes outline to Mr. Kirk and Ms. Phillips. Um, so you're welcome if you've got any questions, I'm happy. Thank you for letting me talk at you for um, so long. It's always nice to get out and talk about something. Any questions? You know I live.